All right, well, the, the first question that I had, just to start us off, was tell me a little bit about how you found this story, and uh, did, did you find it, or did it find you? Uh, it, it kind of found me. I, um, Facebook, I, I never thought Facebook was good for much, but one day I just sort of idly said, I really want to make a, like a feature-length documentary. I hadn't made one up to this point in my life. And a friend of mine noticed that, and he had actually done an article for Minnesota Monthly about the whole criminal activity of, of Wild Bill. And um, he told me about it, and I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. And then he also told me there was like, Hours and hours of 16 millimeter film, and so then I then I, you know really thought that was a good idea because apparently you need you know images to make a documentary. So that was pretty lucky. Definitely. Does anybody else? If you got one, go ahead and come on up here. I've got one more. Just tell us a little bit about the beginning. It says in the quote, uh, "The following story is often true," and uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that that's gotten me in trouble. I um, while I was interviewing all of these guys, they occasionally would tell me different stories, and um, like the the polar bear story, there was a lot of disagreement over whether that was uh, Bill Cooper's polar bear head or if it was Dick Luckin's polar bear head, and no, nobody seemed to remember. But but more of them thought it was Bill Cooper, so we kind of went with that story in the movie. And then I and then I realized well. Documentary films are almost as made up as narrative films sometimes because you're relying on these people's faulty memories. And uh, so I thought it would be a, a funny quote to put at the beginning of the film to just kind of indicate you, you never know what's true. Um, but then I actually had a couple of film festivals, uh, documentary film festivals, write back and say, uh, this appears to be a mockumentary. We don't run mockumentaries, so uh, we're not going to accept your film. And I, you know. Once you've been rejected, they don't they don't really listen to your you know pleas as you type. Uh, no, it's real, I swear. So got it's a disaster it. occasionally. Well, I've got a couple more, including where to get one of those yellow sweaters with a snowmobile on it. But before we get to that, we've got a couple other folks here waiting to. Could you say your name first? When you um, hi, my name's Nicholas. I just want to know what was it like being able to meet these guys? What was it? You know, what was the whole experience like for you? Uh, it was great. They um, didn't really know what to think of me at first because I think they'd probably gone 40 years, 35, 40 years without really anybody being that interested in this you know, crazy story. And so I think they were a little uh, 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 mistrustful of me at first. And it took a few interviews and a few times talking to them um, to where they, they finally realized, oh, may, maybe this guy isn't so bad. Um, they still never really, you know, opened up to me. I, I never got anyone to, you know, cry on camera or, you know, uh, uh, talk about what it felt like to almost die. But I think that's, I think that's pretty common in the upper Midwest. I don't think people have emotions here very much. Um, so, you know, I, I think I got as, I think I got as much emotion as these guys probably felt in, in years uh, out of them. Uh, one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think, Bill would possibly be alive at this point. Do you think he would still be around, probably, or? Uh, well, I I kind of have two answers. I mean, I I there's what I want to believe. I I want to believe, you know, that he's running around, maybe in Canada, or maybe he's in the audience there tonight. I don't know. I mean, I kind of want to. Well, I I can't really see. He might be there. Uh, I, this guy. I, this guy's, <laughs> guy's leaving our room. I, he looks suspicious. Yeah, I, I keep I keep hoping hoping you know that he'll just show up at a screening, but that hasn't happened yet. So you know, there, that's the other thing. I, I there's what I want to believe, and there's kind of what I've come to believe after talking to so many people, and it looks doubtful. But I, you know, I don't want to I don't want to close the mystery. I'm saying because you know, the way those guys are talking about him, he sounds like quite the survivor. Well, yeah, I mean, if anyone could survive, I think he probably could. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks again for taking the time to answer a couple of questions. How old do you think? We've got a couple of folks with the question, have you done the math on how old Wild, Wild Bill would be at this point? Yep, he was born in uh, 29 or 30, so he'd be 83, 84 years old now. Um, so it's possible. We've got one more. The question is, did he have a, a family with a wife, kids, anything like that? He had the stepson. And the, go ahead and talk about that. Yep. 
Yeah, his stepson was was in the movie, and I did interview. Uh, he's got a, a, a couple of uh, other stepkids and, and a couple of kids, and um, his wife actually uh, died not long after the second expedition failed, and that's a lot of people think that's probably what contributed to him um, uh, turning to uh, you know, drug smuggling to make some extra money. Um, she had some, uh, you know, health health bills, and so. Uh, um, this is, I, I guess, it's a pro healthcare movie, a pro universal healthcare movie in a weird way. I, I don't know. All right. How did your uh, How did your opinion change of Bill as you go through the whole process? I mean, just watching the film, we go from you know he's here and then he drags the dog and he dr down here and then he, you know, our opinion kind of went up and down, and I'm sure it was even more so making the film. Yeah, of course, there were some people would tell stories about how you know. Uh, he was kind of a hard man at times, um, uh, but rarely would they tell them on camera because people, I mean, ultimately they loved him so much. He was such a, you know, fun, fun guy. And, um, you know, when I started making it, all that I knew was all the, the criminal stuff that was out there because he was a fairly notorious guy in, in Minnesota. And that's what most of the newspaper articles were about. And so it was really fun to kind of work backwards and discover all the adventurous stuff that he did. And um, so I really grew to love him, you know, during the course of making the movie. And, and when it came time to making the movie, I mean, I, I wanted to give some indication that he, that he could be kind of a hard character at times. So I, I put a couple of those stories in there, but you know, other stories, I, I just, I grew protective of him and I, I loved him and, and I didn't want to, especially if there was any doubt about the story. Cause you know, he made some enemies along the way. So I think he's a okay guy. All right. We've got two more questions. Looks two more like. questions quick. Uh, maybe I missed the dates, but what was the period of that, uh, that first expedition and second expedition? What were those years? The question, just let me repeat it for the recording, um, was about when the dates were for the two different expeditions. Yeah, the first expedition was uh, 71, I think January 72 it started, and then the second one was uh, early 73. And then um, uh, the guy who wrote the original article has like a, a fat book with a timeline, everything that ever happened to him and every kidnapping he may or may not have been, you know, uh, connected with. And, and I, he, the consensus is that sometime in 78 he, he disappeared. Let me repeat it again. The question is about modern technology and, and if with all the new technology we have, has anybody tried to repeat the trip? Yeah, I asked his son, uh, Dusty Cooper, about that. It was a goal of his for many years to actually pick up where his dad had left off in, in either Greenland or, or uh, Spitsbergen Island and, and, and make the rest of the journey. Um, but a lot of people since then have have either the, the climate has made it just much more difficult to travel up there. Um, and then uh, I guess snowmobiles have gotten much heavier. And so, you know, if you did run into some rocks, it's, it's just a lot harder to carry them as far as they did. So they kind of feel like they, they hit it at the, the right possible time. It, it was uh, 71 to 73 was also kind of a mini ice age up there. It was really uh, extraordinarily cold, cold, much colder than usual. So um, they kind of lucked out. I, I've talked to some Arctic explorers who said, uh, some of the places they went, like going from Ellesmere Island over to Greenland, that that's not physically possible. There's no way anyone could have ever done that. So they don't really know how they did, they did it, but they did it. Any more questions? All right. Well, thanks again, Mike. Let's give him a round of applause, Mike. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, we've got a request for you to come see us down here in Chattanooga. So I'd love to. I've never been. This is. I guess the first time I've been there, just without my body. So I'll try and come down with my body sometime. That'd be great. All right, great. Well, thanks again. We really enjoyed the film. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.